Thank you everybody for joining us today for our Invasive Species Citizen Science Training. Of course, we wish we were all together in Antigo right now, but uh, we're glad that we can at least join each other virtually. My name is Ann Pierce and I coordinate the Wisconsin First Detector Network. And if you're not familiar with WIFTN, we are a statewide citizen science program. So we focus a lot of our work on training people how to identify and report invasive species. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So I'm gonna to toss it over to Alex and let her introduce herself and tell us a little bit about the work that we're doing here today. All right, thank you, Anne. As she mentioned, my name is Alex Bjorklund. I'm coordinator of Timberland Invasive Partnership. We serve Oconto, Langlade, Shano, and Menominee counties in Northeast Wisconsin. We're called a Cooperative Invasive Species Management Area, or a CISMA. So we were really excited about this opportunity because we haven't had the chance to do many volunteer activities like this. So when Ann came to me with this, this potential for funding so that we could do something like this. It's very exciting, especially because our area, which is partially in the Northwoods, kind of up north a little bit more, we don't have as many residents, we don't have as many people contributing to that citizen science as um, some other more populous counties do. So thank you everybody for being here. I'm really sorry we couldn't see all your lovely faces today. Thanks, Alex. So Alex alluded a little bit to the fact that, that we're looking to train more people to help with monitoring invasive plants in TIPS region because uh, they cover multiple counties and so they can use all the help they can get with their monitoring uh, and that helps inform their management. And so I'm just going to kind of put that in a broader context. And one of the reasons why we encourage people to learn how to identify and map invasive species is so that we can improve invasive species management. And as you can see on your screen, one way to look at management is to divide it into these five steps. The first of which is identifying the species that you have on your property that you want to manage. And that includes both the invasive species and any species that you're trying to protect or enhance on the property. The second step is then understanding the population of those species, because if you're trying to develop a management plan, you really need to know what you've got. And because management of invasive species is very species specific, you then need to go to step three, which is to research the appropriate and most effective management techniques for your situation and the species you have. The fourth step then is to apply those management techniques, get out there on the ground, remove those plants. And then the fifth step is to make sure that you do follow up monitoring and treatment. And so today we're really focusing on first identifying some of those priority species and second, with understanding those species populations, we're really talking about mapping the, lo the location of those populations and the extent or how big they are. So you know, probably if you're on this call, that anybody who's working on invasive species management, whether it's a landowner or a group like Timberland Invasive Partnership or a park, we're all working with really limited time and resources. And so mapping where our invasive species are and how much of them we have really provides crucial information for being able to prioritize where we're managing the invasive species and what species we're managing. And so we're going to jump right in to step one and talk about identifying invasive plants. And I'm going to start by talking about Wisconsin's invasive species rule, also known as NR40. So that's the chapter NR40 of the State Administrative Code. And this is a rule that regulates invasive species in the state of Wisconsin. And the primary goal of it is to provide education about invasive species. So generally just to make people aware that invasive species are an issue. And then with that education piece, the goal is that as people are more aware of invasive species as a problem, we'll all be able to work on preventing the introduction and spread of invasive species. Within the state of Wisconsin, there are over 200 species that are listed in this invasive species rule, and then they're classified into categories of prohibited or restricted. And those classifications direct kind of what is allowed or disallowed for these different types of species. Prohibited species is kind of the more severe classification. So these are species that are either not in the state yet or they're in very small stands. And so it's 
feasible that we could keep these species eradicated statewide. Species that are prohibited, you are not allowed to transport them, possess them, transfer them, or introduce them. And so basically with these species, if somebody has them on their property, the Department of Natural Resources has the legal ability to make sure that that population gets managed. This doesn't uh, look like, you know, DNR knocking on your door and slapping a fine or a citation on you. Uh, what it looks like in real life is when a population of a prohibited species is made known, DNR will work with the landowner and sometimes be able to provide, provide funding for that landowner to control that population in an effort to prevent that species from becoming a statewide problem. Our restricted species, on the other hand, are those that are already pretty widely established across the state of Wisconsin. And so there's not really any feasible way that we could eradicate them statewide. The regulations are mostly the same as those for prohibited species, but you'll notice that you are technically allowed to possess or have these species on your property. You are, however, highly encouraged to manage them if you do have them. So to give a couple of examples, uh, for prohibited species, the pictures on the left show kudzu, which many of us know as the plant that swallowed the south. It has not yet been found in Wisconsin, but it is knocking on our doorstep. It's been found as close as Evanston, Illinois, so just north of Chicago. And so the reason why we have it on our state invasive species list is because if and when it does show up in Wisconsin, we have a legal mechanism to be able to put resources that includes money and teams on the ground to be able to deal with those new populations. On the right side of the screen, you'll see garlic mustard, which probably most of us are familiar with. And this is kind of what I consider the poster child of our restricted species. It is fairly widespread across the state, especially the southern half of the state where I live. So there's not any chance that we're gonna be able to eliminate this completely from Wisconsin but it's still a plant that can be managed locally. And then in further north reaches of the state where many of you are, it's still not widespread everywhere. And so there's a good chance that if we put enough efforts towards it, we'll prevent it from being as big of a problem as it is in the southern part of the state. And so if you're interested in seeing that full list of regulated species, you can find that on the DNR website. So moving into looking at some of the priority species and tips area, we're gonna run through the top 10 or 12 species that we're interested in people learning how to identify and interested in getting help mapping within tips counties. And so we'll start with garlic mustard because that is out and growing actively right now. To orient you to these slides in the upper right hand corner of the slide, you'll see that map that designates whether the plant is restricted or prohibited. So you'll note that garlic mustard, as we mentioned, is a restricted species. We also show a distribution map of the species and the points on the map come from a few different so sources, one of which is data that DNR shared with our organization. The other, and the bulk of the data, actually comes from citizen scientists, like hopefully those of you joining the call today, who have submitted reports to us. Garlic mustard is a good illustration with the maps, though, to, to show that this isn't a comprehensive map. If you've been to southern Wisconsin, you would expect that an accurate map of garlic mustard would be kind of that solid yellow across the southern part of the state. And so even for widespread species like garlic mustard, we don't have a very accurate picture of exactly where it's growing. And so in areas up north, we want to get an idea of where it is because the stands are typically smaller and more manageable. But even down south, we want to know where it is exactly because that information really helps land managers and researchers learn more about the plants and how to control them. A little bit about the identification of garlic mustard. It's a biennial plant, which means that it grows as a rosette, which is that center picture um, in its first year. And a rosette is just a clump of leaves kind of growing from the ground. And then in its second year, as you can see in the picture on the right, it shoots up a flowering stalk. It flowers, develops seeds, and then dies. 
And so right now, depending on where you are in the state, you're likely to see garlic mustard in this rosette form where you'll see kind of kidney to heart shaped leaves with scalloped edges. And then especially in the, the most southern parts of the state right now, we're actually starting to see these flowering stalks and flower buds develop already. So as the flowering stalks develop, the leaves get more triangular in shape and less kidney shaped. And of course, the easiest way to double check your identification on garlic mustard is to crush the leaves and it will smell garlicky. Um, this can help differentiate it from some common lookalikes like our violet species and Creeping Charlie. Moving on to a plant that we're not gonna see blooming for quite a while yet, we're talking about wild parsnip. This is another restricted species in the state. This one, as you can see from the map, has been mapped a little bit better. Solid blob across southern Wisconsin is definitely true. So this is a monocarpic perennial, and what that means is that it lives for multiple years, but then it flowers once and then dies. And so the flowering stem, which you can see at the right, grows up to five feet tall. You're gonna see it in very sunny areas. So it can invade grasslands, meadows, it really loves roadsides. You're not gonna see this one in the woods though. And you'll see these bright yellow flowers from June to July and kind of beyond that uh, into the later summer. Wild parsnip is a member of the carrot family. And so it has a very characteristic uh, flower head that you see in all of the members of the carrot family. It's called an umbel, so it, on the whole, it kind of looks like an upside down umbrella. And you'll note that the, the yellow flowers set it apart from many other members of the carrot family, most of which have white flowers. Right now, if you see wild parsnip, it will be growing as a basil rosette, and you can see that in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. So each of these leaves has usually five to seven pairs of leaflets, and those leaflets are kind of toothed and a little bit wavy. It has grooved stems, as you can see uh, when that flowering stem shoots up. The lower right hand picture shows that. And if you're not aware, a uh, wild parsnip is one to really watch out for because if you get the sap on your skin, and your skin is exposed to UV light, it causes a burn. And it can be as severe as a second degree burn that leaves a lot of scarring and blistering. And so this is one that a lot of people definitely want to manage because of that health concern. So working with the Wisconsin First Detector Network, we ask people to report all of these species. And on the screen right now, you'll see two of the species that we most commonly get kind of mistaken reports of wild parsnip from. And so the one on the left is cow parsnip. And you'll notice that cow parsnip has white flowers. And so that's an, a really easy way to set it apart from wild parsnip. Cow parsnip is a native plant. Um, if you look at the leaves though, especially this big leaf on the lower left corner of the picture, you'll see that the leaves are kind of more palm shaped, more like a maple leaf shape. And if we go back to our previous slide, the wild parsnip leaves have those pairs of leaflets kind of ascending up the stem. The other species that wild parsnip often gets confused with is golden alexanders, another native plant, and that's the picture on the right. It's easy to confuse these species because golden alexanders also has a yellow umbel flower head. If you take a closer look though, in the middle of this picture, the leaflets of golden alexanders are usually just in groups of three, Whereas remember those wild parsnip leaves have five to seven pairs of leaflets. So 10 to maybe 14 or 15 leaflets per leaf. Generally golden alexanders also blooms earlier in the summer. So we start seeing that one kind of late May into June. We don't really see wild parsnip blooming in a typical year until mid June or later. Up next is spotted knapweed. This is another restricted species, pretty widespread across the state. This is another perennial plant, but it does persist as a rosette, as you can see in the lower center picture, for up to four years before it has that flowering stem. Spotted knapweed has very characteristically deeply divided or very lobed leaves, and the leaves typically have kind of a grayish green color on them. They really love dry areas, so if you have sandy soil, or kind of the rocky sandy mixture right on the shoulder of the road. That's the ideal habitat for spotted knapweed. 
taking a close look at the flowers, this plant doesn't bloom until midsummer, but it will continue blooming into the fall. It's got these flower, these kind of fringy pinkish to purple flowers that look a little bit like thistle flowers. And right below the, the pinkish purple parts of the flowers, there are these structures called bracts. And they, so they look like tiny little modified leaf structures. One characteristic of our spotted knapweed is it's got these dark brown or black tips on each of the bracts. And that's a characteristic that you can actually see on this plant all year round, even on the standing dead stalks that persist through the winter. And even though the flower heads look like thistle flowers a little bit, remember that spotted knapweed is not spiny at all, whereas all of the thistles that you might encounter will be spiny. Up next, we're going to talk about our knotweed species. And so we have Japanese knotweed listed on the slide, but there are actually three invasive knotweed species in Wisconsin. Japanese knotweed is the smallest of the three. And then there's giant knotweed, which as the name suggests is basically the giant version of Japanese knotweed. And then those two species hybridize and form Bohemian knotweed. Aside from some size differences, they mostly look the same. So they're all kind of bamboo-like plants. They have tall arching stems. On the Japanese knotweed, they grow to maybe 10 to 12 feet tall. On our giant knotweed, they can be 15 or 15 feet tall or taller. The knotweed leaves are kind of spade-shaped and usually have a flat base on them. The giant knotweed leaves are bigger and more have more of a heart-shaped base. And then the bohemian knotweed leaves are kind of an in-between shape. All of them have these plume-like clusters of flowers that you can see in the picture on the upper right that bloom late in the summer. So a few more close-up pictures. Uh, on the left side, you can see the stem of Japanese knotweed has these swollen nodes, which is one of the reasons why it looks a bit like bamboo. On the upper right-hand side, you can see that uh, a stand of knotweed kind of later in the fall and these standing dead stems will persist through the winter. The lower right, it's kind of a fuzzy picture, but that's just a solid stand of knotweed along a river um, out in New England. And so our big concern with knotweed is that it can spread really easily in these riparian areas because it can re-sprout from very small fragments of either the root or the shoot. And so if you have flooding events, it can easily carry pieces of the plant downstream. And knotweed grows so densely that once its stands get established, typically nothing else can grow beneath it. And so especially along our lake shores and our rivers, that leads to really bad erosion problems along our banks and impacts water quality. The other reason why we want to target knotweed is that it can damage infrastructure. Um, it was in its native range, it grows on newly formed volcanic soils. So it can actually go grow through concrete and asphalt. So if it's near roadways or buildings, it can grow through that concrete and asphalt and damage that infrastructure. And I know that Alex and her team have been doing a lot of work on knotweed control within Tips counties. Um, so it's always great to, to keep an eye out for new populations of this that pop up. One other species that uh, kind of loves wet areas is common reed or Phragmites. So those of you living along lake shores might be particularly concerned about this one. In the upper right corner of the screen, if you look at the map, you'll notice that this is one of our what we call split listed species meaning that it is restricted in part of the state and prohibited in another part of the state. And that's based on a county by county uh, level. And so Phragmites uh, is very, very common and densely growing in the eastern half of the state, especially in the Lake Michigan Basin. If you go to the west part of the state, it is still a, a pretty rare species. And so it's still considered prohibited there. So this is a perennial grass, loves growing in wetlands and shorelines, grows very tall, up to 20 feet tall, has very dense clones. If you look uh, at the picture at the bottom and the right, it has those very feathery, dense plumes, plume-like flower heads. And the stems of the invasive Phragmites are very rigid and kind of rough, and the leaves will stay on the stem through the winter. Now, as we note, there is a native Phragmites as well. Generally, those grow in far less dense stands and the stems are smooth. And if you're looking at it later in the season, it drops its leaves. 
So this is one that can be tricky to identify, but we have experts across the state that work with Phragmites. And so even if you just think you've found Phragmites and you're not sure, number one, whether it's Phragmites, and number two, whether it's the native or non-native, it's a good idea to mark that location, try to send us some really detailed pictures, uh, and we can try to send somebody out to scout that and verify whether it's the invasive Phragmites. So moving out of the world of our herbaceous plants and into some of our woody invasive plants that we're looking at in Tips region, we're gonna start with the bush honeysuckles. And I think if anybody here has been working on invasive species for a while, you're probably pretty familiar with the honeysuckles. They're very densely growing shrubs, many, many stems coming from a single base on the shrub. So they kind of end up with a vase-like shape. They generally grow six to 12 feet tall, but they may grow taller. All of our invasive honeysuckles have these opposite toothless leaves that you can see in the bottom left corner of the screen. And then very distinctly shaped flowers that are very fragrant. Uh, they bloom early in the summer. As the stems get older, they have kind of shaggy peeling bark. And then there are a few other shrubs that have opposite branching. Uh, where the, the leaves or the branches come out from the same point on the stem. And they can look a little bit messy, kind of like honeysuckle does. Um, so things like elderberry and nine bark can, can easily get confused with honeysuckles. So one trick that we use to, to double check identification, and this is particularly helpful when there aren't leaves or flowers on the plant, is to check the pith of the honeysuckle. And so the pith is the very center part of the stem. So if you cut into a stem of the plant in honeysuckles, at least our invasive honeysuckles, that pith will be hollow. Now there are four species of honeysuckles that are regulated in Wisconsin. And so three of them are restricted. Those are the ones that you see on your screen right now. I don't really think it's worth trying to identify these two species. If you can determine that it's one of the invasive honeysuckles, that's good enough because they all get managed the same. And some of these species hybridize. So the Maros and Tartarian honeysuckle hybridize to form Bell's honeysuckle. So identifying two species gets really, really tricky. We do have a fourth species of honeysuckle uh, that is one of those split listed plants. So it's restricted in the southern part of the state and uh, prohibited in the northern part of the state. And it looks like the cutoff is right about uh, in Tips region. And so this shares all of the same characteristics as those other honeysuckles. But if you look at the leaves, and this is maybe more apparent in the lower left hand corner, the leaves of Ammer honeysuckle tend to be a bit larger than the other honeysuckles. And they have a very noticeable pointed tip on them that is kind of a more abruptly pointed tip compared to our other invasive honeysuckles. Moving on to another well-known uh, pair of woody plants. So we're gonna talk about the buckthorns and we have two invasive buckthorns in Wisconsin, common buckthorn and glossy buckthorn. Uh, so common buckthorn generally has mostly opposite leaves, although some of them are what we call sub opposite. So they're just barely not opposite. They're, they're just barely alternate. The leaves on common buckthorn have small teeth on them. Glossy buckthorn has alternate leaves that are toothless. One has four petaled flowers, the other has five petaled flowers, but they both have flowers that are kind of so tiny and greenish looking that most people don't notice those anyways. And then common buckthorn is most aggressive in well-drained soils, while glossy buckthorn is most aggressive in wet soils, but they both grow everywhere. And so let's take a look at some pictures to compare them. On the left side, we have common buckthorn. The bark tends to be kind of a dark silvery gray and it has these dark lenticels or spots on the bark. If you look at the leaves, they're very egg shaped. And I always get a little annoyed with the common names because one is called glossy buckthorn, but they both have very, very dark green glossy leaves. So when you're looking at the common buckthorn, one way to tell that it's common buckthorn is looking at the vein pattern. The veins on common buckthorn kind of go from the base or the middle vein and curve towards the tip of the leaf. Whereas on our glossy buckthorn on the right, the veins go more towards the edge of the leaf as opposed to curving up to the tip. 
And then again, back to our common buckthorn on the left, it has very, very small teeth along the edge of the leaf. Glossy buckthorn has smooth edges on the leaves. And then our glossy buckthorn bark tends to be more tan in color and it has these light colored lenticels. So up next we'll look at Japanese barberry and this one surprises some people because it's a very commonly planted shrub in a lot of landscaped areas. I know when I walk through my neighborhood this shrub is planted in probably at least every other yard in the neighborhood because it's so well adapted to so many different growing conditions but it is a problematic invasive plant and a regulated invasive plant in the state. When you see this shrub in those landscape settings, it's usually a very compact rounded shrub, at least if somebody's been trimming it and maintaining it. When it escapes into our woodlands though, it can grow up to six feet tall and it has very long arching stems, kind of like multiflora rose, if you're familiar with that invasive plant. So it kind of sprawls out more and creates a very dense thicket. The branches, which you can see and both of the top pictures are reddish brown and deeply grooved. Sometimes they kind of zigzag. There will be pairs of flowers below each spine that turn into these pairs of bright red fruits. And if you're trying to identify this one in the winter, you can scrape the outer bark off and the inner bark is fluorescent yellow. So that's a great characteristic if you're walking a woodland in the winter. Now you might be wondering why there's a picture of some ticks here with our barberry, and that's because barberry has been associated with higher densities of deer, -like, deer ticks or black-legged ticks. And as you probably know, those are the ticks that carry Lyme disease. And so being that Wisconsin is already kind of a Lyme disease hotspot, we're really concerned about our growing infestations of barberry in our woodlands uh, because of the, the increased prevalence of Lyme disease. And so this is one reason, aside from the fact that it creates really nasty thorny thickets, uh, that we really want to know where these plants are so we can manage them. Now sometimes we get asked the question about, somebody will say, well I still see barberry for sale in a garden center, how can that be if it's a regulated plant? And so if you go to the DNR's website and look at their full list of regulated and regulated plant species under that NR40 rule, you'll see that for species like barberry that are still commonly used as ornamental plants, they've actually exempted some of the cultivars from the regulated list. And so that means that basically cultivars that either produce no or little fruit or cultivars that haven't been tested for fruit production and seed viability yet are still able to be sold. Now, personally, I would say if you're out shopping for plants for your yard, I would steer clear of the barberries. Um, if they produce fruit at all, birds love to eat the fruits if that's what's available to them and that's how it's escaping into woodlands. On to another very commonly planted ornamental species, burning bush or winged euonymus. So this is another commonly planted shrub. If you look at that picture in the lower right, You'll see why, because it has really beautiful, brilliant fall foliage. This one, though, if you're looking for it out in our woodlands, um, fall is a great time to look for it because that bright red really stands out. But looking at the picture in the lower center, it's really easy to distinguish this plant really any time of year because it has these very distinct corky wings along the stems. And so that's what you're looking for with this plant. There are a few other euonymus species that are kind of shrub to tree-like, and they might have some ridges along the stem, but they're not gonna have these wide, corky wings on them. And so this one, we've seen some pretty hefty populations of it uh, over in the western part of the state, kind of in the lacrosse area, but we're thinking that this one is pretty underreported. So it's one that we're keeping our eye out for because we, feel like it's probably escaped in more areas than have been recorded and we'd really like to deal with this right away. Another ornamental plant that is now considered invasive is oriental bittersweet and so if you're not familiar with this one it's a, a woody vine. On the right side you'll see that it has these glossy leaves and the top center picture, kind of the lighter colored leaves in there, that, that's bittersweet, that's grown up into the tree canopy 
So this one's extremely damaging because it actually wraps so tightly around the trees and shrubs that it grows on, over that it cuts off the vascular tissue of those trees. So it literally suffocates them because it makes it impossible for those trees to move water and nutrients within the plant. Not to mention that the weight of the vines can also pull down uh, even full size trees, especially with like wind storms and ice storms that are moving through. So this one has clusters of fruit in the leaf axles, so kind of all along the stem. And the fruits are orangish in color with yellow to orange capsules around the fruit. Now this is another species that has a native lookalike. And so the easiest time to differentiate these is in the fall and winter when they have their fruits on them. At the bottom of the screen in the center, you can see our invasive bittersweet has those small clusters of fruits kind of all along the stems, right where the leaves used to come out before they fell off for the, the winter. Compared to the picture at the lower right with our native bittersweet, bittersweet, they have larger clusters of fruits that are just found at the very tips of the stems, not all along the stem. Those were some of the species that Alex had indicated were top priorities for tip in terms of monitoring and reporting. And I wanted to share two other species that are statewide priorities for reporting right now. The first is called lesser celandine, and this is a member of the buttercup family, which you might be able to see the resemblance if you look at the flowers on the right side of the screen. So this is a, a spring ephemeral plant that emerges and flowers pretty much when the snow melts. And it has glossy green kidney shaped leaves and it's a ground cover so it doesn't grow very tall. It kind of just looks like a smaller version of a marsh marigold and you'll see it growing in wet areas like marsh marigold does. So it can grow in wet lawns but also along our lake shores and stream banks. So to differentiate this one from marsh marigold, it only has one flower on each flowering stalk whereas marsh marigold could have maybe two to five flowers on each stalk. And then at the base of the flower, which you can see in the picture kind of in the lower center part of the screen, there are these three green sepals uh, that you'll see underneath the petals. Whereas on marsh marigold, you won't see those structures. Lesser salandine also has what we call bulbils on the stems, and that's the center bottom picture. So these are reproductive structures that can break away from the stem and spread really easily by water uh, and help this plant establish in new areas. It also has tubers, which you can see in the lower right hand picture. And so those are other reproductive structures. And so this plant is, like I said, is often found in wet areas. And so both, of the, both those bulbils and tubers uh, spread really well by floating in water. And so we have some really massive infestations of lesser salandine down in the southeastern part of the state, but we really want people to keep an eye out for this right now because once it flowers, then it dies back by June. And so this is one that we really have a limited window of time to look for each year. The other statewide priority species that I wanna share is golden creeper. And this species isn't even regulated yet because it's so new to the state but this is a very fast growing vine that also loves wet areas. The picture on the lower bottom, the center bottom, uh, shows an infestation kind of in the St. Croix River area on the Minnesota side of the river where the golden creeper vine has just grown over everything along that corridor. So this is another plant that has tubers, which is a reason why we're seeing it spread along rivers. It's a member of the cucumber family. So if you grow cucumbers in your vegetable garden, you might see the resemblance in the leaves and the flowers. It'll have these yellow flowers kind of from July to September, uh, and then it produces red fruits. And so this one, uh, as the map shows, we know we have populations in southwestern Wisconsin. Uh, there were more populations found in Waukesha County, just outside of Milwaukee. Um, but it's one that we really want to keep an eye on and look for it, especially in our riparian stream bank areas across the state. I also want to point out that on our First Detector Network website, we have additional identification information. So right now we're at the First Detector Network website, but if you want additional identification resources from our homepage, 
you can go to the right side of the screen and click on I want to access fact sheets and ID videos. And that will bring you to a page that looks like this and you scroll down and we have a whole list of videos and fact sheets for a variety of our invasive plants, including things like the garlic mustard that we talked about today and then a few other kind of more common species like Canada thistle and dame's rocket that we did not cover today. So now that we've covered identification of those priority species, we're going to move on to the mapping portion of the training. If you remember back to the beginning, we talked about how important it is for TIP that they have more eyes on the ground that can help them track the infestation so that they know when and where they need to manage some of these plants. Um, and so we're going to demonstrate a few tools that you can use to submit these reports and help us get that information that TIP and other land managers can use to plan their invasive species management. EdMaps is basically a national organization that works with invasive species and they are the biggest national database of invasive species records. So they have a lot of resources on their website related to invasive species and they've also developed a number of apps uh, for smartphones and tablets that make reporting and mapping the plants easier. So we'll cover one of those apps later today too. So as I said the EdMaps website is where you'll find lots of information about invasive plants. If you decide to join our forces and start mapping invasive plants, you'll need to register for an EdMaps account. And so you can do that from this website, which is eddmaps.org. And when you get to the website, you'll hover over or click on this human in the upper right hand corner of the screen. And I'm logged into my account right now. So it just shows my option as being to log out. But if you haven't registered yet, it will have a register link on here. And it'll bring you to a long registration form but the only information you need to include on that form is your name and then an email address. And then if you're working with an organization like Timberland Invasives Partnership or maybe a lake association or Ice Age Trail, you could put that organization as well just to help us know what group you're working with. The other information that the registration form asks for is all optional. So just name, email, and then if you want your organization. On the website, uh, the menu across the top will help you navigate to different features of the website. One thing that we like a lot about the EdMaps website is this species information tab kind of in the middle of the menu. And as I mentioned, EdMaps is a national database and so it has information on species from all over the United States and Canada. But if you want to learn about a species, you can put the start typing the name of it in the search box. So. Let's go with our friend garlic mustard. It's kind of the star of the week right now because it's popping out everywhere. And then you can click on that species name and you'll see that there's a pretty lengthy description on what that plant looks like. It shows the ecological threat. So if you want to know why the plant is considered invasive, this is a good place to check. It has links to additional resources about the plant. And then the EdMaps website has really nice pictures of the plants so you can see what it looks like in different life stages. And then finally it shows some maps of where that plant has been reported. And so this map with the green on it kind of shows the county by county report. So it's pretty clear that garlic mustard is primarily an issue kind of in the upper Midwest and uh, the northeastern part of the United States. So that's a really handy feature of the EdMaps website. Another thing that you can do on the EdMaps website is actually report plants that you found using the report sightings tab. And so it looks very similar. It's going to ask kind of what are you reporting and we're focused on plants today. So we'll select that and then it will ask you what state or province you're reporting in and we're in Wisconsin. So here we are at the EdMaps reporting form and it will note that the red fields are required. And so that's going to be the name of the species the date that you saw it and the location. And those are the same pieces of information that we at the First Detector Network require for every report. Plus, we also ask people to submit photographs of the species. And so we could select our species again. This will show us everything, but we'll go with our garlic mustard species of the day. The date is filled in. So if you observed the species a couple weeks ago, 
uh, you can go ahead and change the date to reflect the day that you actually saw it. And then scrolling down to our location, it already says Wisconsin because we selected that earlier. You can select the county that you're in, and I'm way down in Dane County right now. So once you select your county, it will zoom to that county. Now, if you are out walking and happen to take a picture and maybe had the location services on, on your phone for your pictures and have the GPS coordinates, you can go ahead and enter those in the latitude and longitude box. Otherwise, to the right on the map itself, you can zoom in. And I'll just go ahead and zoom in to the, the Lakeshore Preserve on the UW-Madison campus because I know there's lots of garlic mustard there, unfortunately. But then at the top of the map, you can use these tools to show exactly where that infestation is. And so one option is to add a marker. So that would just be a point. And so when you drop that, it will give you the exact coordinates of where you place that point. So this currently is just using a Google satellite view. So if you're in an area with trails or roads, it can be very helpful to mark where you are. Now the thing about garlic mustard and many other of our invasive plants is that where there's one, there's usually a lot more than one. And so if you're trying to map this information to be used by land managers, they need to know kind of how much of this plant they're dealing with so they can plan their time and resources. And so the map has this polygon tool or shape tool on the, the right side of the tools menu at the top of the map. And so we can actually draw a polygon over the whole area that's infested. And so I was actually just walking out at the preserve this morning and I know that this whole section, I'm just clicking uh, on where I want the corners of my shape to be, but I know that this whole area has garlic mustard in it. And so now if I share this data with the land managers at the preserve, they know that they're not just dealing with one plant, they're dealing with this whole area. If I scroll back up the reporting form, you'll see that it actually automatically calculates the area. So about 1.4 acres of garlic mustard exists there. And so that's really helpful information for the land managers. And that's basically all you need to tell them, but you'll see that there's lots of other options that you could fill in on the reporting form. So that covers the location. The other information, like I said, that we ask people to submit for the first detector network is to share photos of the plant. And that's because in Wisconsin, before we release these reports to the public side of the EdMaps database where anybody can see where they've been reported on a map, we want to verify them to make sure that we're sharing accurate information. And so hopefully you'll be able to take pictures of the plants and upload those and then you can go ahead and submit your report. So the last thing I want to show you on the EdMaps website before we get to the app is this My EdMaps tab. This is where you can go to view reports that you've submitted. So if you're working with an organization, this is handy because uh, you can click on your reports tab, which is on the left side of the screen. It's the third option down on that menu. And you can see all of the reports that you've ever submitted. And so you can see I've been mapping a lot of squill recently, um, but if you scroll to the right side of this table, there's a manage column that lets you view, edit, revisit, or delete your reports. So whether you report directly through this EdMaps website, or if you report with the app that we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, you can view those reports here. And so if a verifier asks you to update your report or add an image to it, all you have to do is go to this My EdMaps tab, click on the reports list, and then for whichever report you need to update, you can click edit. And so that just brings you back to the same reporting form. So let's say I needed to add a picture, I would upload my picture, I would click submit report again, and it just updates that same report. So that is the EdMaps website. And I wanted to show that to you because it's, like I said, the backbone of the tools that we use. It's where all of our reports end up, whether you report directly on the website, report through the app, or send us an email report. But as you can tell, like this isn't a very convenient tool to use in the field, especially if you're trying to map a large area. So GLEDN just stands for Great Lakes Early Detection Network. 
And as the name suggests, it's an app that's designed for the Great Lakes region. And that just means that the species included in the app are those that you'll find here in the Great Lakes region. There are apps for all the other regions of the United States that have species lists specific to those regions. So what the app allows you to do is very easily map your infestations and take pictures of them within the app and then upload those reports to the EdMaps website. And so just as we've mentioned before, no matter how you're reporting invasive species to us, make sure you're giving us the species name or at least what you think the species is because it's okay if you, you aren't 100% sure on the identification. Tell us what day you observed that plant, where you found it, and ideally you'll share a GPS coordinates to the latitude and longitude, and then pictures of that plant. And so we ask for multiple pictures including maybe a picture of the whole plant and then close-up pictures of things like the leaves or if there are flowers and fruits that really helps us verify your reports. So to submit a report or to use the app the first thing obviously is that you have to download the app um, and so you can find it in the app store if you have an iOS device or Google Play if you have an Android device. You might have to search for like Great Lakes EDN or GLEDN to find it in either of those places. And as we mentioned before, you also need to register for an EdMaps account to upload your reports. And so you can do that on the EdMaps website as we showed before, or you can do it directly within the app. And a reminder that we just need your name and email address. The email address is just there so that the report verifier has a way to contact you if they need more information about your report to be able to verify it. This is a, an overview of what the app menu looks like. And so we mentioned you could register for that EdMaps account within the app, and that's the third option up from the bottom of the app menu if you choose to use that instead of going to the EdMaps website to register for an account. But to make a report, you want to select your species, and you can do that. Uh, either using the species categories option, the all species option, or my species list, which is a way to make a custom species list to map. We'll look at the all species category as our option, and when you select that, you'll see a list of all of the species in the app. And if you take a look at this list, you'll notice that it has plants, it has insects, uh, it has diseases, so it's got all taxa of invasive species in it. And instead of scrolling through this huge long list to find your species, you can use the search box at the top and start typing in the name of your species. Now we mentioned that this app has a, a built-in field guide. And so uh, looking at the left most screen, that's our list of species. To access the field guide portion for each species, just click on that information icon. And the first thing you'll see is a, a screen with pictures of the plant. And so you can swipe uh, left to right to view more pictures. At the bottom of the field guide screen, you're, there are the options to see the images, the info, or the map. And so the middle one is the info. And so that's that written description of the plant. And it's exactly the same as what you see on the EdMaps website. The rightmost option is the map. And so if you click on that, you will see the map of all of the points for that species that have been reported to the EdMaps database. Now, when you open this on the app, it does use a fair bit of data to load the map. So if you have limited data or you're not connected to a data plan on your device, you, you might not wanna bother with um, looking at the map if you're out in the field. But you can zoom in on the map, so you could zoom all the way into your location in Wisconsin to see exactly where it's been reported in your area. Now remember, the first time you use your app, make sure that you let it use your location uh, while you're using the app, because one of the, the main points of the app is to get an accurate mapped location of the invasive species you see. You also want to allow the app to use your camera uh, within the app. The left side of the screen here shows what the app reporting form looks like. So it's kind of a slimmed down version of that form that we saw on the website. So you can't put as much information directly into the, the pre-filled fields in the app, but you'll see at the bottom that there's a note section so you can add as much information as you want there. And then you can always go to that My EdMaps tab on the website 
an update your report if you want to include additional information. The top of the reporting form shows the species and then the date and time that you opened the report. The next option down is to take a picture. And this is just letting you take a picture directly from within the app. When you tap on that, you'll see the screen on the right, which lets you either take a picture or if you happen to have a picture of that infestation in your photo library, you can select it from the library. Typically, people just take the picture within the app. And that's where you uh, take your pictures and you just need to click on the camera multiple times if you want to take multiple pictures. And then if you're one of those pet people that has, you know, tons and tons of adorable cat or dog pictures in your photo library and you're always running out of space on your phone because of all the pictures on there, not to worry because the photos that you take in the app are just stored in the app itself. And then when you upload your reports, they're completely off your device. So they're not taking up a bunch of storage space. Next up on the reporting form is that mapping again. You'll see that it automatically gives you your GPS location and then an estimate of how accurate that location is. So something like 10 or 5 meters is usually good enough, but if it's saying something like 65 or 100 meters, it's not super accurate. And so the nice thing about the app is that you can tap on that map icon and manually correct for any GPS error or add more information. And so as you can see on the, the picture on the left, there's a red marker that's kind of in the courtyard of those buildings. And so that's where the app thinks you are. If you wanted to change that location, all you have to do is tap on the screen where that infestation actually is and a blue dot will show up. So that's really handy. Number one, if your accuracy isn't so great, you can manually correct and give a more accurate location. Or number two, if you're monitoring, say, along a river and you see some Japanese knotweed across the river from you, but you can't get across the river to map it accurately, you can just open that map and place the point where the infestation actually is rather than where you are standing. At the bottom of the map screen, you'll see again that we have the option for points or polygons. And so if we switch to polygon, it's the same thing as we showed on the website itself. You just tap the corners where you want the polygon to be to show the extent of the infestation. And at the top of that polygon map screen, you can see that it, it automatically calculates the size of the infestation here too. Finally, after you've saved your report, the upload queue, which is about halfway down your app menu, will show a red box with a number in it that shows the number of reports that you have. And so that red box is kind of your reminder that you've mapped a lot of things, but that all of that information is still in the app on your device. And in order for anybody else to know about it, you need to go into your upload queue and actually upload those reports off of your device. And so I'm showing the Apple version of the app right now. The Android version looks a little bit different, uh, especially in the upload queue. So if you are using an Android device and you're having trouble figuring it out, definitely get in touch with me and I can walk you through it. But once you're in the upload queue, you'll want to select this actions option. And when you do that, the options at the bottom of the screen, including select all and upload, uh, up here and so you can select your reports and then hit upload and then it'll give you a message that your reports have been sent to EdMaps. So some people then wonder well what happens with your reports and so this is just a quick chart I'm not going to walk through this completely because you can see this when we email the slides but basically as soon as you upload the reports you can see them in your My EdMaps profile but a general EdMaps user can't see it on the map yet the EdMaps reviewer or verifier will get notified whenever reports are uploaded. And then we go in and take a look at the reports. And when they're verified, then other EdMaps users can see them. If we're unable to verify the report because we need more information or it's an incorrect identification, we'll either kind of change the information as needed in the report to make it accurate, or we'll contact you as the reporter to help us improve the report. I wanted to give you a sense of some of the things that we do with the citizen science data that you all can submit with the app or via email to us. And so on our First Detector Network website, we have this tools tab. And the first thing I'm gonna show you is what we call our WISTIP viewer. And I apologize for all the acronyms, um, but this is an interactive map of all the invasive plant records. And I already had that 
open, so we'll head over to this tab. Basically, this map shows all of our known terrestrial invasive plant records, and that includes wetland plants too, like our purple loosestrife and Phragmites. And so it's interactive in the sense that you can zoom in and out on the map to see what's been reported near you. And then there are these drop down menus kind of below the graph that lets you update the map. And so this DNR classification option, if you only want to see where prohibited species have been reported near you, you could select that or you could make a custom map of just species that you're interested in uh, using this species menu. Or if you turn into a super reporter and you just want to see where your records have been mapped, you can go ahead and put your name in and the map will update with your records. The other tool I wanted to show you, which you can also access on the Wiften website is our invasive species calendar. And so one of the things that we struggle with as professionals, but that we know volunteers struggle with as well, is just that huge number of invasive species that are regulated in Wisconsin. So I don't know if I mentioned, but we have over 140 plants, just plants that are regulated in the state. And so it's really difficult to keep track of all of those. We've got the calendar open here and we're gonna let it reload and then hop to the plants tab. But what we've done with this calendar is to try to make it easy for people to come up with a limited list of species to look for based on the habitat that you're looking in and how detectable a species is in a given month. In the rows, we each row is a different species and then the columns are the months of the year and the color of the circles tells you what the dominant life stage is of that plant or species during that month. So green, you're basically gonna be looking for leafy vegetation. Yellow, you can look for flowers, things like that. And then how filled in the circle is, is how we denote how detectable the species is. And so if you look at the lower right hand legend, you'll see if a circle is completely empty, that means that that species isn't detectable in that month. And so you shouldn't even bother looking for it. And so just like on the map, we have drop down menus across the top that you can use to customize this calendar. And so for instance, if we were in habitat and we just wanted to look in wetland areas, we can apply that. You'll see that our list has updated to only include species that grow in wetlands. We could also limit it to our particular month of the year. So maybe we wanna look at April, May, and June, we'll apply that and let it update. And then maybe we only want to see species that are going to be highly detectable in these months and we'll apply that. And now you'll see that our list has been simplified. And so in April, we might be looking for garlic mustard, the buckthorns, the honeysuckles. Uh, in May, we're still looking for garlic mustard, but now we might notice those autumn olives and yellow iris. And so this helps you limit the list uh, of what to look for. I am going to throw it back to Alex. I think she's going to share with us, you know, with all this information that we shared about what species we're concerned about in the area and then how you can report them. Alex is going to kind of wrap it up by sharing some of the priority areas within TIPS region where they could use your help with the monitoring and mapping. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for handling all that identification and training us all up on those apps. A lot of really good information, which if you, anybody ever needs help with any of that, I'm available for help with managing that or using apps or any other questions anybody may have. So to start out with, as far as priority areas, as far as Timberland Invasives Partnership is concerned, TIP, we are in this dark kind of blue area here. Those are our four counties, which make up our entire boundary. And I normally work out of Kashina within Menominee County, where we're kind of centralized. So we do have quite a bit of monitoring going on within Menominee County, just because it is small and a lot of it is tribal land, which falls outside of my jurisdiction. So the only areas that we kind of have any sort of gaps in information are kind of on private property, which we've been trying to work on. So if you know somebody who maybe would like more information on invasive species or would like somebody to come out and take a look at something they find suspicious, we are available and right in the area to do that. 
that does go for our entire area. That doesn't just have to be, you know, within Menominee County, but there's a lot less places for invasives to hide, I guess, within Menominee County. This is a little bit of our area. This kind of darker green within here is Menominee County. To the south is Shano, a little bit of Okano over here, and Langley to the north and west. What we're looking at is just kind of a layout of all the invasive species that we're aware of right now. A lot of the stuff within that Menominee County area we are aware of, but there have been issues with reporting and getting everything uploaded. So those are just kind of public roadside places. Um, there are a lot more incidences in that area though than are showing on this map, just to be clear. And the reason we're not showing a lot of the southern half of Shano County is because we just genuinely don't have a lot of visibility there. We don't have any ongoing projects in that area, so we don't have the funding to be monitoring that area. As you can see, we kind of have quite a few populations of things like those exotic bush honeysuckles. That's any of the species that are considered invasive. Um, garlic mustard, common buckthorn, wild parsnip, Japanese knotweed, Japanese barberry, and spotted knapweed. Um, there are other invasives present, but these are kind of the big ones that are recognizable and that we would want our um, citizen scientists to actually be looking for. Now, the areas that are in need of monitoring, as I mentioned, that southern half of Shano County, as well as Shano County in general, could really use um, just general attention. Okano County is also generally not very well monitored. We are beginning to do monitoring there and we are working in the capacity that we can, but those, both of those counties, we're kind of limited as far as what we have monitored so far. So a lot of help could be used specifically there, but anywhere you can do it, whether it be within the tip area or, or anywhere within the state is a huge help because even finding out about species presence outside of our counties gives us a better idea of what could potentially invade within our jurisdictional boundaries. Pretty much any area that is public or county owned that you know, has the potential for invasion can be monitored. That includes parks, trails, state natural areas, which I believe unfortunately are closed right now. So don't go out there if, um, if they're closed, but Anywhere that you can access, you can do this. And as Ann mentioned, you can do it right on your phone with the Gladden app. You know, sometimes I'll be out even in Brown County where I live and I'll try to contribute some information if I have the time. Uh, roadsides are another great place to monitor. I know a lot of our monitoring that we do is just from the roadside and kind of as we're driving to known sites, if we notice something, we'll jot it down and make sure we get it into the database but there are so many roads throughout our four counties that we have just never even had the chance to go down that if you live on it or you go by it and you notice, hey, there's some wild parsnip, that's super helpful because it's so much easier to know, you know where we can put our time and effort. Besides that, your property is a great place to monitor. We don't have access to that as an organization, obviously, so knowing that you know there's a significant population of garlic mustard that might be creeping onto other properties or creeping into natural areas or even just becoming a nuisance as they are known to quickly do is great to know and we are available to help with that type of situation whether it be you know i'm not sure if this is what i think it is or you need advice on controlling or you need somebody to actually come and control we can provide all of that but those are just some general areas that are great that we would need help with. Speaking of Oconto and Shano County, most of the area within these counties are in need of monitoring. If you look at this map over here, this is kind of central west Oconto County around the town of Breed. Um, we are working on uh, monitoring county forest roads and we will be starting this year on monitoring the Machikini area down here. So although we do have these very specific sections that we're monitoring, there is a whole lot of area that we do not have eyes on the ground, we could use help. So wherever you, know, you might be, if you're in that area, that would be helpful to know more information. And a lot of the problem we see with monitoring like this is the county themselves are very aware of invasives, but it's not actually documented. So they know that if you look at the 
141 corridor, there's a ton of wild parsnip within the right of ways and within the um, middle of the highway, that kind of dividing area, but it's not actually put into any database. So even just getting a better idea of where known populations extend to is really helpful. Granted, um, I don't ask that anybody be doing this on the highway. That is a terrible idea. If you're, um, if you're driving or trying to get out of your car, please don't do that. We want safety to be the priority here. I did not include a map of the Shawano Lake area because I think most people in our area probably have a general idea of where that is. But we are doing monitoring around Shawano Lake for Japanese knotweed that Anne mentioned earlier. So that's another area that is already being taken care of. But as far as the rest of Shawano County, we're only finding new populations of Japanese knotweed specifically because we have people calling us and letting us know. So using these apps and getting them into the database so we can see exactly where they are and take a look at pictures and see what they look like, um, what kind of extent they're reaching is super helpful. Or just giving us a call if you, you know, even if you don't feel like doing it yourself, if you do have a chance to follow up and give us a call, that is super helpful too. I know I kind of went over Menominee County a little bit, but just to reiterate, there's not much area that is accessible by the public unless you're a tribal member. So the only areas that are really available for most people to monitor would be uh, the county highways through there. So 47, 55, and um, the Legend Lake has a lot, area has a lot of private property and one public boat landing. So not much to work with there, but that's all right because we are in the area a lot. We have a lot of eyes on the ground as far as our tribal conservationists, as well as just the uh, county employees that we work with there. In Langlade County, we have plenty of area that is also in need of monitoring. Specifically, areas along the Ice Age Trail would be great. I know we have a member of the Ice Age Trail Alliance on here, which is awesome. So if you're out enjoying that area and you see something and you'd like to put it down, that would be wonderful. We don't have the time or funding to be out and covering so much of that area. We're, we're really limited as far as where we're already working and where we can see on the way to these places that we're working if we aren't doing a specific monitoring project. So that's super helpful. As far as a general place to monitor, anywhere within the western portion of Langlade County is actually kind of out of our funding range. We do have general funding to do extra activities, but that usually needs to be allocated to things like administrative time, some extra mileage for some grants that don't provide it. So the majority of our funding comes from the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which is only allowed to be used within the Great Lakes Basin. So if you look on this map, pretty much all of our county is well within it, but Langlade County in here only has sort of that eastern, northeastern and southeastern portion that's in it. So all of that western half really you know, if I happen to be driving through it and I see something, I can do that, but we don't actually have funding to do the monitoring there. So getting that type of input from people besides our county uh, conservationists and our county employees is really helpful because we can't really put the time needed to actually monitor and inventory in that area. So just knowing where it is, we can get a better idea of what we're working with there. And then when there is funding available to apply for that will cover that area, it actually helps us a lot because we know that there's an issue. We're not just applying for funding that we can, you know, hopefully use. So anything over there would be great. Langlade County also has a ton of ATV and snowmobiling trails. We actually did a project within Timberland Invasives Partnership a couple years ago that allowed us to access private properties with permission, of course, to get a better idea of what type of infestations we have on these trails that fall within private property. So that was a big help getting a better picture of what we were working with, but there are still a massive number of places that we were not able to get to that you know landowners didn't wanna participate or we weren't able to get in touch with them or we just didn't happen to see anything on that monitoring trip. So if you're riding the trails at any point, you can see some of this stuff in winter, which is a little bit more difficult, but if you know what to look for or you want to learn more about that, maybe come fall, 
we can talk about that um, and I can give you some resources too because some of this stuff is fairly visible in the winter if you're snowmobiling. Otherwise, you can use the pretty normal field season identification tips and tricks to find stuff while you're out enjoying those trails. As far as roadsides and properties, we ask that you remember your safety is always a priority. We would never want anybody going out and walking on a busy road without you know, a high visibility vest or anything that could cause them any type of injury or danger. So if you choose to survey a roadside, make sure you are doing it in a safe manner. And you know, there's no need to hop out of your car on the highway or on a busy county road just give us a call. We can go out and take a look at it on our own time. There's no need to be doing that. In addition to that, we want to make sure that you're only surveying within the right of way if you are on roadsides. It's important that we're, you know, not going through private property or, you know, you're not trespassing essentially. So most, I believe town roads, it's a, I think it's 33 for some of them. It depends county to county, but um, staying within about 10 feet of the edge of the road is a good rule of thumb. I'm sure this is common sense for most of you, but never enter a property if you don't have permission to enter it or you're not sure of the ownership. So, you know, if you know you're in a county park or a state forest, whatever it may be, you're totally fine. But if you're not sure whose property it is or what type of um, designation that has, just stay on the safe side and, you know, maybe look at what you can see from the road, but no need to go and get any sort of trespassing issue. Thanks, Alex. So Alex just gave a really nice overview of places you can go within TIPS region to help map and monitor invasive plants. So our contact information is, is on your screen now. So I want to give a huge thank you uh, to Alex and Timberland Invasives Partnership for partnering with us on the training today. As we said at the beginning, we're really, really bummed out that we weren't able to do the in-person workshops that we planned, but hopefully things will ease up at some point and we'll be able to join each other in person in the future. As we said, please get in touch with us if you have any questions about specifically where to go. Um, and those questions about where to go are, are best directed to Alex if you're in one of TIPS four counties, but otherwise feel free to get in touch with me and I can help direct you if you have trouble getting started using the app or have additional questions on that, definitely feel free to contact me with those questions because that is my job to help people kind of get started with this technology. Just to add one thing that, Haley, you actually kind of reminded me of this. If you do find yourself looking to get into monitoring or you think you're going to have some time in a day that you want to go to a specific location, feel free to contact me and We've found it's a lot easier for people to identify invasives if they're looking for one or two in particular instead of just trying to remember all these separate invasives. So like I said, if you give me a call, you know, and you're, you let me know you want to go out to this park or this area, I can give you an update on what we know could potentially be there or what's nearby and give you a little bit more information as far as what to look for. Again, thank you everybody for joining us. 